right, who are working to try to drive AI and automation into core functions and are walking the inductive path of trying to build end-to-end -end experiences that you know, have to contend with the complexities of the real world and have to, in often cases, and oftentimes be deployed into mission-critical contexts. And you know, what we're really talking about here is the need to build and deliver full-fledged AI products, right? Not thin wrappers or simple solutions. Products that can be used to drive things like clear-to-build workflows, that can be used to power the distribution of assets across a logistics network, that could be used to personalize customer recommendations across tens of thousands of locations. Products that you know, have to, in essence, surface the full complexity of data, logic, and action, and then allow you to enrich those primitives through all the different types of mobile applications, web applications, uh, edge applications, and more that you want to build and have to build for your stakeholders while being connected back to a common model of the enterprise. So if we think about what it means, like what does it take to build capital P AI products? Well, if we kind of think about the requirements for the underlying tech stack, they start to seem pretty different from the traditional three-tier architectures or cloud-native architectures, right? For one, if I think about the infrastructure layer, it's a lot more than just kind of standard elastic compute and storage. It's like, I need a hardened auto-scaling stack that can actually um, enforce node cycling to you know, protect us against advanced persistent threats, enable zero downtime upgrades, enable zero trust networking, give us pervasive auditing and monitoring frameworks, and a whole lot more. That has to then link into a security architecture that governs all AI and human activity. So these are role-based access controls, of course, but also marking-based controls that can flow with information and purpose-based controls that can provide conditional access and revoke them. I also need then a full spectrum data integration engine to be able to connect to hundreds of different data sources, whether structured, unstructured, streaming, geospatial, all of it, and be able to actually integrate and transform it at scale using batch and streaming processing. I need to be able to pick the run times I want to use while all adhering to a common set of health monitoring, security services, lineage services, metadata services. All of that has to work in concert with our model integration framework. Right? And that's both conventional models that I'm building, maybe in my data science environments, and these are optimizers, business rules, algorithms that I might want to deploy in as containers, or might want to connect with via APIs, um, but that's also the LLM integrations. So how do I connect securely to the full range of commercial model providers and open model providers we want to use? All of that, of course, then has to be surfaced in the workbenches where we build our LLM-driven functions, we build our agents, we define our processes consisting of objects, links, actions, and functions. We need the entire eval suite and so much more, essentially every component that will go into our products. And then, of course, at the tool chain level, I need a flexible tool chain that allows me to build the way I want to build. So maybe I want to use the package SDKs, maybe I want to use just the raw scoped APIs, maybe I want to mix and match these things and then use a templated builder that gives me quicker time to value. And you know, the requirements just kind of run off the page. And even with this view, though, it's still kind of fundamentally misrepresentative because it's not about a fixed set of requirements at a single point in time. It's about how these requirements can actually flex over time. Because as we're seeing with AI-driven product development, it's all about the iteration speed. Cycle time is king. And so what happens when I add 12 additional data sources? What happens when I need to swap out my LLM? How about when I change my entire front-end framework? Or I 10x the amount of users on our products? What if I do all of those things in two days? Does this thing still hold up? That's the real test of an architecture. And you know, what it all points to is this need for leverage, right? that can meet the ambition of the builders in this room. Leverage at the platform level um, that can actually scale with time and maybe increase over time as you iterate on the operational experience of your products and as you increase the surface area of what's being automated. And you know, it's this relentless hunger for more and more leverage that drives our roadmaps for our platforms. And we know that means, but it's not limited to, the need to give you more options for integrating data from more, from more sources and building context into every AI-driven workflow and process you're building, regardless of the type of data or the substrate that's coming from. That means providing builders with the ability to integrate more sources of logic, the business rules, the algorithms, the other things that are not just reasoning capabilities for human workflows, but also tools for LLMs increasingly. 
It means the ability to define more sophisticated action and being able to chain these actions together and being able to also invoke more complex behaviors outside of the four walls of your product. It, of course, means having the freedom to mix and match from the latest generation of LLMs, but also it means having a more robust evaluation suite and set of capabilities to continuously assess at runtime how these models are actually performing so you can pick the right models for the right workflows. And of course, it means having more ways of integrating human knowledge, both so you can understand the, the flows of the processes you're trying to automate, and then as you drive automation, being able to assess and calibrate the nature of that automation over time. And many of these considerations coalesce in the ontology system, which sits at the heart of the Palantir architecture. And I'd just like to note that I made it 19 slides into this presentation without saying ontology. And so that is a personal record. Um, my version right now, simply put, my riff, is the ontology has to provide maximal leverage for builders who are delivering AI products. And that means two things specifically. One is the ontology has to allow you to smoothly increase the amount of automation in your products over time. And the way it has to do this is by providing a shared model of decision making between humans and AI. And what does that mean? That means we're representing the semantics, of course, such as the objects and the links, but also the kinetics of a process, the actions, the functions, the process definitions, and giving you the dynamics, the actual simulation and branching capabilities to evolve things over time. Um, and I think that one thing that we're seeing in the field is the better representation, the higher fidelity the ontology is as a representation of your operational world, the smoother that curve is. The second point is the ontology has to drive down the marginal costs of product delivery over time. And so this means that as you assemble all the different components to build your first product, you should be building a reusable inventory that gives you more speed and leverage as you build your second product or as you build more sophisticated things. And, and sort of that key and that momentum principle is kind of central to how we think about building the ontology system. And a lot of the like, just clear intent of this is to invert the physics and the, and the incentives of the software industrial complex and all the legacy architectures of yore, where you know, it's really meant to be parasitic and extractive versus providing more leverage over time. So if we think about the ontology, you know, zoom in a little bit, we have the ontology and application tool chains, which sit over both platforms. Foundry and AIP. Of course, Foundry gives us all the tools for building, integrating data pipelines, for being able to build conventional models, for being able to manage our ontology, for being able to manage the entire life cycle of our use cases and much more. And AIP gives us everything for building with generative AI, right? From LLM driven functions to agent building to being able to define the state machines we then automate to all the eval frameworks and a whole lot more. Both of these platforms, which you forge with, sit on top of a set of backend services, right? And we kind of think about these as the backbone of the operating system. These are the ontology kind of core services that give you all of the expressiveness of the language, but also the engine that allows you to query billions of objects and take tens of thousands of actions. That's substantiated by a set of data services that provide foundational connectivity and the metadata flows for everything happening around the data flows, the AI infrastructure that, can, that pertains to both conventional and LLMs and generative AI, the workflow services that allow you to run interactive compute, batch compute, streaming compute in all modes heterogeneously across all your workflows. All of that is, of course, underpinned by a common security and governance layer. And of course, in a box that I think is a little misrepresentative in size is the software delivery layer, which is really revolves around Palantir Apollo and providing you all those guarantees at the infrastructure level. 